Now, China's foreign currency reserves, they have skyrocketed to more than two and a half trillion dollars. Yes, with a T. I guess that's the letter for today. China's critics say it's another sign that China continues to support the U.N. at the expense of the U.S. dollar. That's the issue before our taking stock think tank. Let me introduce them. Our guests are Ann Lee, professor of economics and finance at NYU and was also a visiting professor at Beijing University. We also have David Simmons. He is an economist at Standard Chartered Bank, voted one of Bloomberg's best. And Don Gimbel, senior managing director at Carey Asset Management. Great to have you all with us. And I should say, I'm glad that I've actually learned how to finally pronounce the Chinese currency. It's yuan. We've been talking yuan for all these years. And is this a situation where we've got to also learn that China is going to go its own way, whatever the U.S. government wants? I don't believe that's going to be the case. I think that the Chinese are going to recognize the U.S. is not going to tolerate this because the U.S. has a very serious unemployment problem and that eventually uh, the Chinese will have to appreciate the yuan in order to appease the U.S. and divert a trade war from happening. Uh, the United States has a very serious unemployment problem and that is the result of over two billion people joining the global workforce and making the U.S. laborer uh, uncompetitive against all these other low-wage workers. And in order for U.S. Uh, workers to be absorbed again and be competitive, two things have to happen. Either the U.S. economy deflates to emerging market levels or emerging markets have to inflate to U.S. levels. And the Federal Reserve has made it very clear they're not going to let deflation happen. And so the only thing they're going to do is inflate with QE2, keeping interest rates low. And that's, we're seeing that. We're, they're driving asset bubbles around the world. And that is an attempt to inflate the rest of the world. David Simmons, if that indeed is possible, that we're seeing this inflation that is at least being attempted by the Federal Reserve, doesn't that uh, sort of lower the value of the debt of all the countries that are holding U.S. government securities and China holding some of the biggest part of U.S. government bonds? Yeah, I mean, China definitely recognizes that their relationship is symbiotic. There's not one winner or the other. They need to work together on this. The thing is, they are the biggest holder but the thing is, you are going to have the Fed stepping in and pretty much swooping up all the new issuance coming forward if QE play, QE2 plays out as we expect. So the thing is, they are going to be concerned about what the Chinese does, but I think the Fed is very much focused on U.S. domestic policy at mo the moment and leaving the Treasury focusing on the foreign policy. So maybe it's not just politics that begins at home. Maybe it's economics that begins at home as well, Don Gimbel. What does the investor take away from this? I mean, we've heard from the finance minister of Brazil in previous uh, days talking about currency wars. You see the U.S. dollar at 139 against the the euro. Leaving aside China for just a second, does the U.S. dollar continue to weaken and eventually that helps all of the U.S. exports? Well, the, there are different reasons for the U.S. dollar being weak or strong against each of the other countries. Uh, the, the, the situation as I see it with China is that the Chinese are interested in what's good for China. Um, the Americans are interested in what's good for the Americans. A, a stronger yuan would only make inflation rise in the United States. Uh, the problem of unemployment in the U.S., in my opinion, is productivity, not, the, not jobs leaving the U.S. for foreign countries. I think, I think that part of the strength of the U.S. economy over the last decade has been the Walmarts of this world being able to find good quality merchandise at, at very reasonable prices in China. And unless the, unless the Chinese currency were to appreciate maybe 40 percent, which isn't going to happen, at least not over the next three or four years, um, uh, it's not going to have any material effect. I, I think there, there are so many examples of people trying to force the Chinese to do things and the Chinese saying, no, we're not going to do it that way. And so I, I, I think that the, the, the secret for U.S. 
is to get along with the Chinese because the United States and China working together are an enormous power. And if they, if they bicker amongst themselves, both are going to be losers. And does China get a bit of a free ride when the U.S. dollar is falling in value against major world currencies? Because right now, the Chinese currency is tied to the U.S. dollar, and they can point to it and say, look, we try to make the, uh, the renminbi, the Chinese currency, greater in value, but look, you keep devaluing the U.S. dollar by all this quantitative easing. Well, our currency is going to fall just along with yours. Well, that has been true, and that's causing all sorts of interventions by other countries right now. Other countries are trying to compete with China as well. So, uh, because they can't rush to China's currency to offset it. So, what... Uh, what the U.S. wants, obviously, is to have something similar to the Plaza Accords in the 80s, in which they devalued and then the, the Japanese yen appreciated by a lot. Uh, the Chinese are worried about that scenario, clearly, because they don't want to uh, suffer from large unemployment and deflation. Um, but the Chinese have to realize that they're not Japan. They are an economy that is much larger than Japan, and therefore they have room to grow their consumption, because right now consumption is about 35% of their GDP, so there is room for them to grow that. And so what they can do is allow for a greater appreciation of their currency while they also, to, to minimize inflation, force labor wages to go up so that there's a greater percentage of the money going to the households so that consumers have more buying power. In the domestic economy in China. Exactly. As, so that will basically create another engine of growth for the entire world, not just Chinese, but for U.S. exporters to export to those Chinese consumers, for European exporters and so forth. So uh, so I think that, yes, they're, they're worried about things moving too quickly and causing massive unemployment. The U.S. thinks, well, it's going too slowly. Somewhere they have to meet in the middle. Now, Don, you've come from the wilds of Montana to give us a little bit of perspective. It's perspective. It's, exactly. real, it's real perspective. Now, when you look at what's happening uh, in China right now, is this the time for U.S. investors to start getting into the domestic economy? Well, here, here's an interesting fact. I, at least I think it is. Uh, GDP per head of population interesting number, is about 9% of what it is in the United States, in China. So you talk about the growth that we've seen in China over the last decade or two. It's been enormous, and the economy has grown exponentially. There are as many middle-class people in China today as there are people in the United States. There's a long way for that economy to go, and it's going to become more and more an import, consumer-driven economy. That's good for the whole world. If we try to force what we've done wrong on the Chinese to make it better, it's going to alienate them and it's going to screw up the whole thing for the United States. So if I was a U.S. investor, I'd like to be invested in companies that are doing a lot of business in China. They might be U.S. companies like McDonald's or they might be a, a Caterpillar. Uh, or, or a Chinese oil company, a Chinese transportation company. Um, there are a whole slug of companies, many, many ADRs listed here in, in the States, as well as companies listed in Hong Kong and Singapore, that give an American investor a step into the world of China, which in the long run is going to be very beneficial for the United States. Well, we've seen, for example, Sinook, the Chinese oil company, make a big joint venture play uh, in the shale of, uh, of the United States, yeah, looking exactly. for natural gas for resources. David Simmons, but isn't this exactly what the U.S. government seems to be doing, which is, all right, we've exported all of this debt that we've lived on for the last, let's say, 10 years, and now we want to devalue that debt. Is there any chance that we're going to really reach any kind kind of agreement with the Chinese about what is fair value for currencies? Well, I think the problem is it's going to be a very slow process. And as Anne said earlier, it's going to be the Chinese want to 
to be, take their time, and the Americans want them to act now. They would want it to act yesterday. And the problem is the Chinese have never really acted by being forced. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. They're going to take their time, and they're going to do it when they feel it's right. Now, you are going to see more pressure coming from the international community. I mean, in Europe, they, their currency against yuan is appreciated greatly. I mean, we were at 11 back in the highs of July, um, June 2007. Now we're sitting around 8 and a bit. I mean, it's really not very good for the European exporters going to wanting to get into the China market. Well, you were just back from London, right? I mean, what is the feeling there about what's going on with the U.S. dollar and making, because, I mean, U.S. companies competitive with European companies to sell into the Chinese market? Well, I think the thing is, in, in London, the, the, they've had the depreciation of the pound over the last two years. So the thing is, they've been benefiting from that. So they're actually starting to see a pickup in their manufacturing industry, which you would imagine is going to be coming into the U.S. because the U.S. has depreciated so much. So those are two major countries that are going to be benefiting from a resurgence in industries that have previously been written off simply because their currencies have become so much cheaper. And what do you think about the notion that if the Chinese are able to let their currency rise in value, would that really have an effect on U.S. unemployment? I mean, would that really change the important issues related to the economy here in the United States? I don't think it will do anything in the short to medium term because these are big mega trends that are happening. And so to focus on the currency issue exclusively is to miss the boat. The U.S. needs to do other things in order to uh, alleviate the unemployment problem. And namely, I think of two major things they can work on. One, they should change their tax policies because multinational corporations now get a tax holiday when they uh, manufacture and do business overseas and don't repatriate back to the United States. And right, pay keep the, the money overseas. Yes. I mean, that's so one of the reasons have to Microsoft pay taxes. Right, exactly. issued bonds in order to pay the dividend, keep the money outside exactly. the U.S. Exactly. So that is a huge incentive for the multinational corporations to hire overseas and sell overseas. And What's the second uh, and thing? So, so the second thing is that the U.S. needs to break the special interest grip um, and let innovation flow. All in right, this we're going to have to leave it there. I want to thank you very much, Andy, David Simmons, Don Gimbel. Appreciate your thoughts on China.